got a presentation on fire, but um, our Mike Sternberg um, can't be here, so Mark has very kindly agreed to give the presentation in his stead. So, Mark, over to you. Okay, thank you. So, I'm Mark Ross from the University of Kent. I was uh, involved in the development of FIRE, which is one of the methods that I'm going to talk about today, and also talk about some of the more recent methods developed in the Sternberg group, FIRE Risk and MISSENSE 3D. So between them, these methods focus on modeling protein structure and then also enabling us to use models of structure to assess the impact of MISSENSE genetic variants. So with databases like Uniprot having well over 100 million protein sequences and the Protein Data Bank having only around 100, 120,000 structures, we, it's important that we're able to model protein structure and the fire into our blue protein, and that gives us a basic backbone. But remember, most of the residues are actually different as these proteins only share 25% sequence identity. So to get a full model, we then need to add on the side chains. So this is what the FHIR web server looks like. We take a very simple approach in that making it easy for the user. So all you have to do is paste in your amino acid sequence, provide your email address so we can let you know when the prediction has been made, and then you just have to hit search. So there are no parameters for the user to mess around with or to have to worry about. And because of that, the resource is actually being very widely used. It's had more than two and a half million submissions. We have more than 200,000 unique users, and the pub different publications have received more than 7,000 citations. The resource is available at this web link here, and it typically takes a few hours for submissions to run. That's also dependent upon sequence length. So I'm just going to explain in a little bit more detail how FHIR works. So the user submits their query sequence, and then SciBlast is run to identify homologous sequences and to make a multiple sequence alignment. This multiple sequence alignment is then fed into SciPred to predict secondary structure of the protein. And then both of these are used to generate a hidden Markov model of our query sequence. And when we use that model using HH search to search against a database of known structures for which we have hidden Markov models already generated. And so hopefully when you submit your sequence, we find some matches to the database, and then we take these alignments, and as I showed at the beginning, we have now got, so this is our template in black here, our alignment in orange, and by um, effectively what we can now do is use this to map the residues of our protein onto the backbone of the template protein. Now, then we then also might have some insertions. So in our query sequence here, we have two regions that have not been modeled because they're not present in the template structure. So these get modeled as loops, which then gives us a complete backbone. And then our final step is to add in the side chain. So then that gives us our final model. So this is what the main results table looks like. You have a list of often very many templates that have been identified, the region of the protein that they've covered. So this is a fairly small protein, and these top three hits have covered all of that region. Then you get this nice picture, which is the model, shows the model, but you can also click on this. Many users don't realize this. They click on that, and they can then download the PDB coordinates for the model that has been generated. Um, you get an indication of the confidence of the prediction, and even here we have very high confidence predictions at low levels of sequence identity. So that's all great, but unfortunately, we can't always find a template for users' query submissions. So in that case, we have Fire Alarm, and I'm sorry for all these bad names, I didn't come up with them. Um, so when we don't find a template, you can use Fire Alarm and so your user sequence is submitted. We run HHBlitz to generate this sequence hidden Markov model. And then every week when new structures are added to the protein data bank, we update our database of structure-based hidden Markov models. And then we search to see if there's anything new for your sequence. 
And hopefully one day there will be, and we get a yes, and then we perform the whole fire modeling, and the user then gets an email that the results have, are available. If there isn't a match, then this continues week after week after week, and then hopefully one day you might get something. So related to fire is 3D ligand site. So 3D ligand site predicts small molecule binding sites in proteins using fire models. So here we have a model that's been generated by fire. We use this model to perform a structural search of the PDB to identify similar structures that have small molecules bound to them. So in this example, we've found three related structures that have small molecules bound to them. And so then aligning those structures to our model effectively superimposes the ligands from those uh, other proteins onto our structure, and we can use that to make a prediction. So you know, we have a cluster here from multiple different structures with ligands in similar positions. Okay, so 3D ligand site has uh, another, again, a fairly simple user interface. I'm just showing the results here for one page where we have a large cluster of multiple ADP and ATP and magnesium ions that have been identified from related structures. And this is a JS mole viewer, and users can then use this control panel on the right to modify the display and investigate the prediction that has been made. So that was an introduction to the FHIR resource. Now I want to move on to how FHIR has been used to obtain information about the effects of genetic variants. So someone came up with this great name, Fire Risk. And so what Fire Risk does is it enables you to map genetic variants from genomic or protein coordinates onto fire, exper both experimental structures and also fire predicted models. So it's available here and it was recently published in JMB. So Fire Risk takes data from Uniprot. So it is, I should say, this is a human focused resource. It takes the human proteins, data on isoforms, variant information that's present in Uniprot, and also interaction data from intact. And then structural data for uh, monomeric proteins comes from the PDB, and then is expanded with our FHIR models, and then protein complex information is extracted from the PDB. And so putting all of that together generates FHIR risk. And then the user is able to perform searches in a number of ways. So if you have variant information, which is either in the form of genomic coordinates or protein coordinates, you can perform searches to do that mapping. Or a user might be interested in searching for a particular gene, uniprot identifier, or even a disease. So if you were inputting genetic variant information, again, we try to keep these resources simple. So you can choose which build of the human genome you want to use, and then either paste in the variant data or upload a file. Multiple formats are uh, available for that. So this is an example of the main results page. So we have a sequence browser which shows the region of the sequence that is being viewed in this JS mole viewer. And you can click on variants that are present here, and then they get highlighted in the structural viewer. Here we have information about the structures and the models that are available. So quite often, as we can see here, there are different models that cover different regions of the protein. So if you click on those, that will then load in that respective model or that region of the structure in the viewer. You're also able to use and consider where variants occur in different isoforms of the protein. And then most of us are often very interested in trying to understand if a variant has some structural effect on the protein that might affect its function and then could link it to disease. And so if you want to do that, you would then click this link to the next resource I'm going to talk about, which is MissSense 3D. So MissSense 3D uh, reports structural effects that are caused by MissSense variants. So here we have an example. This is our carbonic anhydrase 2. And we have a variant, HIS-107, that changes to a tyrosine. And this variant has been associated with a number of mental disorders and physical diseases. And we see that in the wild-type protein, 
GLU-117 forms a salt bridge with histidine-107. However, upon that changing to a tyrosine, that salt bridge is lost. So there's a clear structural effect, and we can then for understand that this has some, clearly must have, as likely as its association with disease, have some effect on function. So that's great if you have a PDB structure, but they only cover about 17% of the human proteome. So if you want to use fire, you can expand that by, we can cover another 37% of the human proteome for, through fire 2 models. However, our users are often very interested to get an understanding of how reliable it is to use a structural model um, to interpret the effect of a missense variant. And so uh, within missense 3D, this has been assessed, and I'm going to explain that. So uh, missense 3D, basically, I'm going to show how it works. In this, imagine here we've zoomed into a particular region of the protein. We have a glue here. This is going to change to a phenylalanine. So we identify any side chains that are within five angstroms of this residue. We then remove those. We also remove the glue. And then we add them all back in, and we add in the new phenylalanine side chain at this position. And the side chains are repacked using squirrel 4. So what we have now is we have the wild type and we have the variant uh, structural environment around that variant, and we can then assess if they have any structural effects. So to do that, 16 structural properties are considered. So these range from disulfide bond breakage, the introducing introduction of clashes, the introduction of charges in buried regions, and so on. So there's no machine learning here. There's no, it's just the method just tells you if one of these features has been affected by the variant. So to evaluate the method on both structures and models generated by fire, they took a set of PDBs, 8,000 structures from mole probity, so these are high quality structures, and then combined that with data on variants from Humsavar, Clinvar, and Exac, and so we're mapping those on. We end up with a data set of 606 structures, and that gives us just under 2,000 disease-associated variants and just over 2,000 neutral variants. And so then we can apply missense 3D for all of those on the structures and also models that have been generated using FHIR2. I uh, should highlight that obviously we don't use the template of the real structure when making the model. That wouldn't be very fair. So, I'll show you the results when we use the experimental structures from the protein data bank. So, we're plotting two things here, the true positive rate and the false positive rate. And so, we have overall a true positive rate of 40%. So, that means that for 40% of the disease-associated variants, we see that one of these 16 structural properties is altered by the variant. And then for the false positive rate, we see that only 11% of the neutral variants, we, do we observe one of these structural properties being altered. And then in the graph, we have the true positive rate and the false positive rate for each of the individual 16 properties. We can see that the disulfide bond breakage was the most highly discriminating feature with a much higher proportion in disease-associated variants and very few examples where it's neutral. So then we want to think about how can we uh, assess whether we can do this with structures. So first of all, how accurate are the models that have been generated by FHIR? So plotted here, we have the sequence identity between the query and the template and the RMSD. And we can see that even at low levels of sequence identity, say 30%, we still have an RMSD of around 2.8 angstroms. So here we show the true positive and false positive rate where we have the models in purple and the PDB in blue, and we can actually see the results are really very similar at a range of levels of sequence identity. So going back to that example that I had earlier, we see that when we have this 36% identity uh, model, we still generate the salt bridge in the model, and we still see that that is lost. 
So clearly, we can use models to interpret the effects of variance. So this is available as a web resource where you can see the, uh, the variance that, and their side chains, et cetera. And so we can tell our users that, yes, we can use structural models to consider missense variance. So FIRE 2 was largely developed by Lawrence Kelly and some input from myself. Fire Risk, led by Charles Ofugbugo and Alessia David, and then Miss Sense 3D by Sirowit and Alessia. So thank you for your attention. So thank you very much, Mark. I've been asked to, um, for reasons with the AV, I've been asked to ask speakers to come up, or ask questioners to come up to ask questions. So has anybody got any questions or comments? Yeah, please do. And you can hear that, good. Thanks a lot for your talk. Thank you. Uh, we're actually also working in a similar domain, and it's very reassuring to see that you can use structural models to predict effects of uh, genetic variants. I was wondering, uh, one thing that we encountered, and we uh, had problems solving that, uh, how do you um, deal with multiple models available for, for your same variant in case, for example, when they are conflicting in terms of the structural impact that the variant is uh, exerting? I'm afraid I have no idea. <laughs> is that's all I can say? Sorry. I don't know. I haven't. I, I, I largely worked on Fire, the modelling resource, and so I, my knowledge, unfortunately, of MissSense 3D is, is limited. Okay, thank you. Sorry. So is that question to be to email to my server? Yes, certainly. Yeah. Okay. okay. Next question. Uh, hi, very nice hi. presentation. Uh, I have one question. Miss Sense 3D, uh, how does it do, for example, for, imagine a transcription factor because we faced this case before where uh, nothing of the protein DNA interface is affected, but there is something far away that helps reposition a loop and that makes the contact with the DNA. Will Miss Sense 3D be able to detect some amino acid that was critical for positioning the loop. In um, the right it's only going to pick up structural effects in the local vicinity of a variant. So um, wherever your variant is, you know, within this five angstrom region, we're removing the other side chains and then repacking. So it's not, you know, your variant might be distant from the DNA binding site. If it has a structural effect, then it would be picked up. But if it doesn't cause any structural effect, then it wouldn't be predicted. Okay. okay. Thank you. Mark, thank you very much once again, and thanks for stepping in. So, uh, just for our next speaker, I need to tell you that this, the presentation scheduled for 11.